morning! So John and I are getting ready to host our very first um, book club discussion and we are discussing Creative Schools by Ken Robinson. Um, so the way that this works is if you have um, anything you'd like to say about the book or about the questions that we're asking or respond to anyone who is um, online, then you can um, just type in your question, your response, your comments into the um, comment section on the Facebook page. Um, or you can go over to Twitter because the conversation is happening on Twitter also and just use hashtag EFreads. Um, and then also if you want a little bit more information, you can um, go over to educationfutures.com slash reads and you can see what other books we are planning for upcoming discussions. So our discussions will take place the first Saturday of every month. Um, and we have uh, three additional books lined up and we're getting suggestions every day for more, uh, more books to add to the list. Um, so I think the first question we'll be posting on Twitter um, right now. Um, so the first question says what, uh, or let's see, please introduce yourself and tell us what other interesting books you've read this summer. Um, so the, I'm Kelly Kalorn Morvek, and um, the most interesting book that I read this summer was um, in conjunction with Hamlin Summer Literacy Institute, and it was um, by Christine Mraz. It was the um, Teaching uh, Mindsets book and it was um, it was really fascinating because it was about how to incorporate um, explicit instruction of different mindsets that we want our students to be using um, along with the curriculum that takes place in the classroom so it wasn't doing something different it wasn't something added it was using what you're already doing in the classroom to enable students to um, use these different mindsets that will help them uh, be successful students so as we're waiting for um, others to join, I'll tell you a little about how this um, book club got started. Uh, so I, most of you know, I am a uh, teacher on special assignment with the Bloomington Public Schools. And uh, I have two roles there. One of them is uh, to coordinate the AVID program, which is a college readiness program for kids that are typically underserved in four-year universities and colleges. Um, and then the other half of my role is to work with Minnesota State Mankato and I place and supervise student teachers there. And one thing that I noticed about um, this job, this is my fourth year in this position, is that it's pretty uh, isolated. And while I do get to travel to you know, several different schools and talk with different teachers and work with different kids, um, one of the things that I miss out on is having the opportunity to have professional conversations with other people in my field. And so we decided that it would be really fun if um, we did sort of like a professional learning community. So you hear about this idea where, you know, teachers come up with an idea they're, they're all interested in and then they decide what sort of resources they want to use or read to be able to um, learn more about that topic and then, you know, start incorporating and implementing um, ideas that they that they found out. And so John and I got together and decided, oh, it'd be really fun to do some kind of book club. Um, and hey, let's make it virtual because not everybody can meet at the coffee shop on Saturday at 10 o'clock, um, especially because we're looking for a more global, international audience. Um, so this is our first shot at um, trying to do the book club virtually and hoping that it, um, it is successful. So it looks like as I'm monitoring Twitter, uh, the first question has posted. So the first question is, um, what should students know and be able to do as a result of their education? So again, if you're interested in answering that question or responding, um, you can use the comment portion of the of your Facebook page to do that. Um, and I will just talk about my thoughts on it until um, we get some other people that are participating in the conversation. Um, so again, the question is, um, what should students know and be able to do as a result of their education? Um, so my thoughts on that are um, that really, you know, I'm not so much focused on rote memorization and facts and, and timelines and things like that, but really my thought is you know, when kids leave school, they really should be equipped with the kinds of skills and strategies they need to be successful in whatever career or uh, college path they choose. Um, so to me that looks like kids are leaving school with the, the abilities to collaborate with other people, to um, solve problems, to identify problems, to think critically, 
um, to to use resources and identify resources to connect with other people, um, you know, within their community, but also uh, outside of their community and around the world, so that we're really, you know, truly working together to identify and solve whatever problems are necessary. So again, we're responding to the question, what should students know and be able to do as a result of their education? If you're just joining in, um, we are discussing the book, Creative Schools by Ken Robinson, in our um, very first book club discussion, virtual book club discussion. We're also over on Twitter, so if you would like to um, join in the conversation there, you can head over to Twitter using the hashtag EFreads, and um, John is moderating the the discussion over there. Um, and <laughs> John's waving at me from behind the computer. Um, so if I'm looking, I'm looking at the responses on Twitter, um, seeing um, most important for me is that students learn how to learn, unlearn, and relearn. So in response to the question, what should students know and be able to do as a result of their education? Um, that's one idea, learn, unlearn, and relearn which for me, I absolutely agree with. I think that's one of the skills. Um, those are skills that um, everyone needs to know because things aren't um, definite, things aren't uh, specific. And um, students need to be able to, uh, people need to be able to um, take what they know, combine that with what they're seeing and understanding and, and feeling comfortable with identifying resources and, and networking and being able to um, change their mind about things and unlearn things and then relearn a different way to do it and then do that again the next time they come up with something that um, doesn't quite follow the framework that they're expecting. Um, so there's another response on Twitter that again the question was um, what should students know and be able to do as a result of their education? Uh, one person says uh, they need to know how to create for themselves, for others in the world how to craft meaningful questions and how to reflect with intent and purpose. Oh, so the, the idea of reflection, that's, um, I think that's key, that's vital. And that's not something that I said in my original response, but um, I think, you, you know, you, we are reflective beings. I mean, if you think about, you know, any situation that you've ever had where you've thought about it over and over or thought about it, you know, afterwards and thought, oh, I wish I'd said this or I wish, wish I'd done this, you know, that's all in reflection. So um, I think that's key, that teaching kids um, explicitly how to reflect, how to reflect on something that's coming up, or I guess maybe that would be pre-flecting? Um, reflecting in it, <laughs> John's laughing. <laughs> pre-flecting, I made that up. Um, and then reflect on something that happened, whether it was good or bad. What would you change? What would you do differently? What went really well? Um, so, but teaching that as an explicit skill, I think that's really important. Um, looking on Twitter, it looks like the next question is just about to come out. I'm going to look at my cheat sheet. Question number two. Um, what is the purpose of teaching? What should it be? Um, okay, so for me, so, okay, first of all, I'm going to, I'll answer that question in just a minute, but I'm, I'm going to say I'm so glad that I'm doing the Facebook Live part because as you can tell, I have a hard time um, keeping my response to 140 characters. Um, so for me to be able to just talk and talk and talk about what I think um, using the, the Facebook Live, uh, it, that's just, that's awesome. So again, question number two was, what's the purpose of teaching? What should it be? Um, so, you know, in my opinion, the purpose of teaching is um, to facilitate learning. There's, you know, we, if we talk about student-centered and student-focused and, uh, you know, but it's it, it can't be student centered or student focused if the focus is on teaching. It has to be on learning. So that the, the role of a teacher, the purpose of teaching is to facilitate that learning. Um, I don't think that's necessarily where we are uh, at this point in um, in education. I think that's where a lot of people want to be. And I think there are many classrooms that follow that philosophy. But I think um, that there are still many more where the focus is on teaching. Um, and if your focus is on teaching, then it can't necessarily be on student learning. Um, so then you've got teacher-focused classrooms or teacher-centered classrooms as opposed to student-focused student, student -focused or student-centered. Okay, so those of you who are on Facebook with me, I'm looking on my devices. Um, I, I'm, 
I don't see any comments that anyone's made, so I'm going to assume that no one's making any. <laughs> Not that my technology is faulty or my use of it. Um, so if you want to join in the conversation, that would be great because um, we're really looking at trying to build a collective capacity to, um, you know, build positive education futures. And it can't be collective if I'm the only one talking. Um, although I can definitely sp fill uh, an hour's worth of space with, uh, with my opinions, it's much more fun to engage with other people. Um, so I'm checking back on Twitter. Uh, so there's a, uh, an idea. So the question was, what is the purpose of teaching? What should it be? Um, one person says, I think it's about connecting learners with wisdom to help us each make the best choices among many possibilities. Connecting, <laughs> connecting learners with wisdom. I like that idea. Um, I, this summer I was at a training in Philadelphia for the AVID side of my job. And um, through, during the training I you know, had this idea about really what is wisdom? How do we define wisdom and what's the difference between being wise and just being knowledgeable? Um, and there's something different there. And I think we kind of landed on during the discussion that I had about it was being knowledgeable, being wise is being knowledgeable, but it's also taking that next step in knowing what to do with your knowledge, knowing how to use your knowledge. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at it as sort of a pyramid and we're thinking about, you know, facts and information, putting those together with your background experiences and your prior knowledge and, you know, all of the things that you understand to create your own personal knowledge. Um, and then that next level is thinking about, you know, the, what knowledge you have and, and being able to use it um, in a way that, that makes sense and is purposeful um, for whatever your end goal is, which I think to me is sort of how I landed on the definition of being wise. Um, looking at Twitter again. So again, the question was, um, what is the purpose of teaching and what should it be? There's another idea about that, um, to encourage diverse mindsets empower students' curiosity, imagination, and wonder, as it is the fuel for lifelong learning. Um, definitely the themes with this book. So we're talking about this book, Creative Schools, by Ken Robinson. Um, and, you know, obviously the main theme was, you know, being creative um, and that creative side of people. Um, so the idea of empowering students to follow their curiosities, um, to, to empowering their imagination, their wonder, um, to create sort of within them this, um, you know, lifelong learning, this love of learning, this wanting to learn um, throughout life. I do, I did see something funny though the other day that caught my attention about lifelong learning. Um, and it was, it basically said, um, <laughs> something like, you're a lifelong learner, hi, I'm alive too. Um, and I think the point was, you know, as, as a person who's, who is living, that's capable of thinking, you're always learning. So no matter what, you're a lifelong learner, whether you're actively seeking out opportunities to learn and engage in learning um, or not, you're, you're learning all the time. As, as human beings, we, we can't help it. Um, but pointing out what it looks like to be the seeker of knowledge um, and, and really working with kids to um, develop within them um, the, the strengths to be able to do that on their own, um, and the will, uh, and the interest to be able to do that on their own, I think is important. Another thought, um, that I have about that, so, again, the question was, what is the purpose of teaching, and what should it be? And I'm looking at this response on Twitter that talked about empowering students' curiosity, imagination, and wonder, and I'm thinking about, you know, the kids who their curiosity, um, their imagination, the things that they wonder about, and how many of those kids, um, for them, the things that they're curious about, the things that they're good at, the things that, that um, you know, are their, are their talents that aren't academic. And so what do we do with those kids? Um, because in our current public school systems, we honor and we support and what we find um, to be ideal are the kids who excel academically in academic types of thinking and our schools aren't very good at honoring other kinds of creativity um, and that becomes a problem especially as kids grow older and what they're seeing is that you know what we celebrate in schools are those more academic pieces as opposed to um, the the areas where they may be talented or creative kids lose that 
kids lose the creativity because they're they're wanting to be successful with what they're doing at school and if they're not being supported they're not being celebrated for the things that they're good at the things that they enjoy um, then it's possible that they lose those talents they lose those creativities because they're not practicing they're not following those curiosities um, and that's a point that Ken Robinson makes in his book and um, something that I've really been thinking about a lot since I finished reading it and you know how do we how do we do that then what what do we do in our classrooms that are standards based um, how do we support kids that think in a different way that are that are more creative that um, you know really really need a different sort of, of output opportunity uh, in in schools and still meet the standards and still, you know, f fulfill our obligations as public school teachers. Um, and I don't have the answer for that, That's, but that's something that's been kind of stuck in my mind since finishing the book. All right, question number three has come out on Twitter, and it is, how can we encourage and inspire creativity, imagination, and innovation within our current systems? Oh, that falls right in line with what I was just talking about. Um, <laughs> so imagine that. Um, so let's see again how can we encourage and inspire creativity imagination and innovation within our current systems so for me i think it's more about you know as teachers we definitely don't have control over what we have to teach or what we expect students to learn um, but we do have control over how um, what we are asking students to do in class to show that they've learned something to um, prove that they've mastered something to, you know, meet the standard that um, is something that is required for us to uh, to teach and, and to assess. So I think, you know, there, rather than, the, the issue I guess that I have with um, the standards movement as it is right now is that um, we're, we take something that's really big, a big concept, and then we narrow, 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 narrow until we've got these tiny, tiny, tiny benchmarks or tiny standards or tiny objectives. And we come, we, we, we teach those individually because that's what we're supposed to be doing. But there's never really a time when we explic explicitly show how they tie together to, to, to build this bigger thing. Um, and so, you know, kids might be really great at meeting each one of those smaller standards, but do they really understand how they fit together in this bigger whole? Um, and so I think, you know, as teachers, what we can control is how students meet those standards. So I'm thinking something like, you know, if you do, if you look at the standards and develop some sort of larger project or a big question that can't be answered just by going to Google and looking it up, um, but, but something that requires students to, on their own as they're exploring, meet specific standards. Um, then you have an opportunity to inspire creativity and their imagination and their innovation, um, and but still show that you are facilitating their mastery of the standards. Um, so we have another another comment on that question. So again, the question was how to encourage and inspire creativity, imagination, and innovation within our current systems. Um, Stephanie Thompson, uh, the most amazing art teacher says, um, creating programs for those kids, fluency, flexibility, originality, elaboration, exercises that grow these can be done in any class. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, for, for kids like, um, like my son, Hillel, he is not really motivated by grades. He's definitely not motivated by mastering any sort of standards. He's completely motivated by exploring things that are interesting to him. Um, and, and being a little bit more creative with the, the output. Um, and so again, I think that we as teachers, even though we have these standards or objectives that we're, that we're meant to meet, um, we have opportunities to create programs, to create experiences for kids um, that, that meet all of their needs instead of um, just parsing out those individual standards and trying to hit those um, as individuals, but really doing something that's big, that's bigger, um, that, that we can tie all those standards to. Um, so going back to Twitter, there, we've got a response that um, let students' interests guide the way. If they care, creativity will follow. You know, that's another piece, that idea of engagement. How do we, uh, there's a live talk in education about how do we engage kids. As soon as you talk as a teacher about I'm going to engage you, um, then it's not about the kids being engaged anymore. It's about me doing some sort of dog and pony show 
uh, that, that gets the kids maybe focused on me for a minute because of the novelty um, or because maybe they're interested. But the true engagement comes from them. And so if we're letting their interests guide the way, then they can't help but be engaged because they're following something they're already interested in. Um, we have another uh, comment from um, Shiny Christy that says, sometimes I wonder how we can retrofit an outdated curriculum to 21st century outcomes. <laughs> I agree. Um, and I think John would agree too. I'm looking at the back of his head to see if he's nodding. Retrofitting outdated curriculum to 21st century outcomes. Right. So um, my thought is, I don't know that we necessarily can. Um, I think that, you know, so there have been incremental changes, small changes in what we do uh, in our current education system that that are on the path to being good for kids and what's right for kids and and um, but what they're doing is supporting the current system and the current system was was based on what our what are what people needed 200 years ago and 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 so shiny Christie, you're right it's it's completely outdated and so to make these small changes to try to to fit with that system that that doesn't make sense anymore for our for our for our current world for our for our you know global citizens um it it, it doesn't make sense to try to to retrofit it like uh, like what you say um but then what that means is the alternative is like complete revolution and that is hard and it's scary. Um, and that's not something I think that people who are in a position of power to be able to be recreating what our education system looks like um, are interested in because if we, if we think about it, the, the people who are making the policies, the people who are writing the curriculum, the people who are, are, are coming up with standards, um, the, the current education system worked for them, right? I mean, if, if we think about what what education was for when public education was for when it was developed it was to turn out businessmen it was to turn out people that could work in a factory um it 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 wasn't to and it couldn't be um to to turn out people who could be successful in a variety of different careers and and you know opportunities that exist in today's today's world and certainly not in in our future world because with things changing as fast as they are, we have no idea what kind of jobs um, or opportunities there will be for people in the future. So our best option to ensure that the, the, the people that, we, that we're turning out of our public education system is to make sure that they're equipped with the, the skills and strategies that they would need to be successful no matter what job or career path or education path they, they follow after they leave our public education system. Uh, okay, back to Twitter. I'm looking at, looks like question four came out a while ago and I talked for a long time. Um, question four is uh, Ken Robinson, so the author of Creative Schools, that's the book that we're talking about in our discussion today. Uh, Ken Robinson advocates for integrated learning experiences, not standardized departmentalized learning. Um, and so the question is, what's our first step? Um, uh, one comment on Twitter is that we just need to connect. Um, and then all kinds of hashtags. So connect and it's Ed Nation, it's Grad Nation, Education Nation, Tutor, Mentor. Um, so, so bringing all of those different worlds together, connecting and coming up with some sort of common goal. Um, we've got another answer. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, my take, we first need to come together to build a collective vision for the what's wise and the hows of education. So rather than kind of starting where what's our first step, it's coming together as a community to decide, you know, what do we want to do? Why do we want to do it? And how can we do it? And then we develop the steps based on that. Um, okay, so again, the question was, Ken Robinson, author of Creative Schools, advocates for integrated learning experiences, not standardized, departmentalized learning. Um, and what's our first step? Um, okay, and so for me, I'm thinking, you know, again, we need to come together. We need to think about what sort of multiple approaches, um, wh how we can, you know, think about a, a, a several standards that, that, that can be met through one big question or one big problem. Um, allowing kids to explore their interests, to, to be, as a teacher, to be the, the facilitator of learning rather than the teacher. So instead of this, 
you know, direct instruction where I, as a teacher, stand up and tell you what you're supposed to learn, and then you, as the student, if you're a good student, you learn it. Um, it's 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 looking at how, you know how a bigger picture idea, taking you know one question or one problem, and allowing kids to explore it and hit multiple standards in that way. Um, so we've got. Um, Stephanie Thompson, again, my favorite art teacher at Valley View Middle School, says, um, my niece is a math major at UWEC. When she asked her advisor what employers looked for, he said creative people. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, the people in businesses, people that are looking for, for uh, employees, they're not looking for someone who, they're not necessarily looking for grade point average. They're not looking for SAT scores. They're not looking at, you know, the advanced courses that you took or, you know, at any of the courses that you took necessarily. They're wanting people that can identify problems, that can solve problems, that can come up with a creative solution for problems or multiple creative solutions for problems. They're wanting people that, um, that can think outside the box. And we're not turning out people in our public schools that can think outside the box if all we're doing is presenting standards and teaching to the standards and measuring that they've met the standards. Um, Shiny Christie says, so when, or so then who decides what these global standards are? Um, are there any active forums that could help us work with a renewed curriculum? Oh, good question. Um, so in my opinion, I, I, I mean, there's, that we're, we're just speaking, you know, in opinions now because there really isn't anyone looking at global standards for sure. Um, you know, I, I agree with the person on Facebook that talked about coming together to build a collective vision. And so for me, coming together looks like parents, it looks like teachers, it looks like students, it looks like administrators, policymakers, business people, um, members of the community um, coming together and, and starting with what are we educating for? What's the purpose? What are we wanting kids to know and be able to do once they leave our public education system? Um, and starting there. And so, you know, the question, question four was, um, you know, integrated learning experiences rather than standardized departmental lear departmentalized learning and looking at our first step. I'm not sure we can come up with a first step until we have a collective idea of what the goal is. Um, because, you know, as... Um, we talked about just a minute ago when we were looking at question number three and shiny christy mentioned you know how do we retrofit an outdated curriculum to our 21st century outcome and you know we're we're at this point we're making small changes that are s sort of band-aids on a system that you know has broken legs um it's it, it's it's not working it might work for a moment um and it might you know show some positive growth for a little bit, but for the most part, we're, we're needing to, you know, overhaul the system. Um, and I think we can't do that until we have a, a group, a collective group of people that can come together with the idea of, you know, what is the common goal? And then how do we move toward uh, meeting that goal? And the other thing I think too, is that it has to be fluid. So we come up with a common goal and then that changes because our world is changing. And we're, through technology, we're becoming more and more connected. And so it can't help but change all the time. So we can't, like what we're doing right now, have this idea about what education is and what it's for, and then go 200 years and continue with the same ideas, the same practices, and, and put Band-Aids on broken legs. Um, so, and Daniel says, we need to focus on different economic support systems available to students in schools, and then create blueprints that show uh, support uh, support kids and families, um, what their needs are that may not be available due to poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and then he posted a, a, a URL to a map over on the Education Futures page. Um, and then it suggests these supports should be available in every school neighborhood for many years. So Daniel's talking about looking at, you know, looking at kids. Our kids are coming to us in public schools, um, in all schools, from huge varying backgrounds uh, and so you know to be able to even start from the point where we're looking at engaging their curiosities we're, you know and 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 to being creative like that's the the book that we're discussing right now um, we have to start with their basic needs and so how do we provide the support for kids how do we make the creative or the the, the safe environment for kids where they feel like they're able to be 
um, creative, where they're, where they're able to meet standards, um, if that's the focus of the curriculum. So really, you know, thinking about taking that, that demographic the, of um, uh, socioeconomic status out of the equation um, for how we look at learners. Um, and what's available to them in, 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 in resources so that we're leveling the playing field for everyone to be um, successful. We're actually, one of the upcoming questions, I don't remember which one it is, it might be the next one. It is, question number five, which actually might already be out because I talked so long. Um, is It talks about, yeah, it is. So question number five is, I think a lot of this, or no, sorry, question number five is um, the idea of misprediction and um, that we mispredict uh, things um, based on demographics um, and so the, the question is where else is misprediction happening and what are the consequences and I think Daniel you hit the nail on the head when you talk about you know that we need to provide economic support systems for our, our kids and our schools that are in need um, because a lot of misprediction happens based on socioeconomic status um, misprediction that happens based on other areas of demographics too um, but I think that's one of the key key factors. Um, let's see, I'm looking on Facebook. So uh, Brennan Fleischman, my favorite daughter, says, um, when I took my introduction into to education class, my professor talked about, about that, but on a smaller level. She talked about how we as teachers in our, uh, on our own needed to constantly be self-evaluating and seeing how we... Oh, I lost my place. And seeing how we uh, can change and be different um, to continue to ed engage and help our students. You know, that hits a really good point, too, because um, we can't, you know, I have a certain way that I like to teach. Clearly, it's talking. I like to talk a lot. Um, and that isn't the best for for facilitating learning because the person who's doing the most learning right now is me um, because I'm the one doing all of the talking I'm the, the one doing all of the reflecting on people's responses um, and so you know thinking about who we are as teachers thinking about you know who 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 our students are and looking at how we as teachers can change um, to make sure that we're continuing to engage all of our students um, all the time um, so looking back at the question number five again was um, Ken Robinson discussed misprediction based on demographics. Where else is misprediction happening and what are the consequences? Um, a few answers on Twitter. One is um, I think a lot of this misprediction comes from measuring the wrong things and valuing the wrong measurements. Absolutely. Um, another is as we share ideas online many in rural or poverty areas don't have access this needs to be fixed so again that and that was um daniel daniel's participating all over the place that's awesome thank you um and then um misprediction has the potential to happen anytime um, an individual is evaluated based on average typical data results of others and the unintended consequences are inappropriate intervention ability grouping low self-esteem undervalued or lost non-academic talents um, so a couple of thoughts there about, you know, valuing what we measure, um, over measuring what we value and in schools right now, especially with this huge standards movement push, um, we, we're forced into valuing, uh, what we measure. And so what we measure at, at this point are literacy skills and math skills. And when, when you do that, uh, the other content areas, especially in elementary school, um, get put on the back burner. And um, time gets taken away from courses like science, like social studies, like health, um, and, and, and arts, and uh, to, to provide more time for literacy and math. And what's happening in literacy and math is they're taking, like, like we discussed before, they're taking these big concepts and they're parsing it out into these small little standards, small little benchmarks, but not teaching how they connect. Um, and so what we're doing, we're doing a huge disservice to kids who have strength in science that could absolutely learn mathematic concepts through their exploration of science. Um, kids who have an aptitude for art or humanities or social studies that could learn literacy practices through those content areas. And instead, teaching explicitly these tiny strategies or these tiny benchmarks or tiny standards um, and then measuring just that. Uh, so we're not giving them real world experiences at all because um, nowhere at all in any of my learning in any of my discussions with peers with colleagues 
Uh, do I learn one tiny part and then move on to the next tiny part and the next tiny part? And then, and then it's up to me to come up with some way to connect all of those together into some larger picture. Um, my very best friend, Eric Ibsen Johnson, says, um, my high school has gone one-to-one -one with technology, and now I have to reevaluate how to utilize the technology effectively uh, for my students and not use it just to use it. Oh, my God. We're cut from the same cloth, Eric, um, which we've known for the last what 20 years um <laughs> as uh yeah i mean that's that, that's one of the major topics um that that john and i talk about all the time i mean honestly what is the point of using technology if it's just to use it i mean absolutely technology is important um as a resource for people to use as a way to connect with other people as a way to look up information as a way to to create amazing things um but just because you have a chromebook doesn't mean that you need to use the chromebook um uh, one of my uh my colleagues in bloomington um talks about you know if you're just using technology to polish your typing skills and your digital scrapbooking skills then there's no point we might as well just go back to using paper pencil and, you know, doing actual, you know, physical scrap, scrapbooking. Um, we, we spoke with someone the other day of that um, is, is a big proponent of using Minecraft in education. Um, and, you know, he talked about, you know, there's no point in, in trying to use Minecraft to engage kids if all you're going to do is have them create dioramas. Right. Have them use a shoebox and create dioramas like we used to when we were kids, if that's really the end goal. Um, so, you know, amazing teachers like my friend Eric Gibson Johnson that's looking at trying to figure out how to re revamp his teaching practices to facilitate the use of um, technology for meaningful purposes. Um, that's a challenge and that's one that not all teachers are willing to, to, to take. And especially when we're looking at districts that are making decisions about one-to-one -one implementation or three-to-one implementation or, you know, purchasing technology on behalf of teachers and not listening to teachers' concerns or needs or suggestions, we're really doing a disservice to the teachers and to the kids. And we're not spending our money wisely because a cart full of iPads that sits in the back corner, unused completely, that's a waste. Uh, for, Eric further says, I'm constantly trying to find discovery lessons that bring in different content so that students see the connections to the real world and that it's not just a math lesson. Right, absolutely. Because again, so Eric's an amazing teacher, obviously. Um, he's looking at the standards as something so much more than just one tiny piece of something that kids are supposed to, to learn, completely disconnected from a bigger picture. I mean, we, we talk about engagement, we talk about motivation, we're looking at, you know, how do we capture kids' interest, how do we take something that's personally relevant to them and put it in a world where they're able to use it for a real purpose, so that the teacher's not the only audience, so that there there's real purpose behind what they're doing and how they're using the technology, rather than just a, a means to an end, um, that, I, that I mastered the, the standard or that I got the A or that I earned the points. Um, we're already on to question number six, and that is, how can we bring students, parents, teachers, administrators, business, and community members together to transform education into something more future thinking? Um, some responses on Twitter are, it's been a big research question of ours. This is from John, um, John Moravec and ours uh, at Education Futures. We found that less served communities love being welcomed into schools. Um, Daniel says, this is a marketing problem, constant invitation needed to bring the village into this process, the village, um, and students can be creating these, absolutely. Um, and, and he says, you know, this takes a village, but who's building it? Absolutely. Um, hop over to Twitter because he's also included um, a link to a, a blog post that you can read to, to further get um, some more ideas about who's building the village. Um, there's a response about inviting and trusting all um, stakeholders to frequent and ongoing discussions to collectively develop goals, outcomes, pathways, and measures. Um, and then if we look at um, Facebook, 
Oh, Brennan, <laughs> Brennan commenting on Eric's idea that, you know, finding discovery lessons and connecting things to um, real world rather than just um, isolated lessons. Uh, Brennan says, I wish my teachers would have done that when I was in school. I agree. Um, one thing, though, that um, that I'll add in connection with that to, to Brennan and, and Eric's thoughts are, you know, Brennan, you posted the other day on Facebook something that said something like, one of the things that I miss the most about being in school was is the opportunity to have real discussions with people. And then the rest of your post was about how you can't stand it when you post something on Facebook or some other social media, and then and then instead of really engaging in conversation, people just want to say something negative and 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 you know offensive. Um, but the first part of that struck me because I my first thought was, wow, you did that, um, because we don't often give kids opportunities to to have good discussions like that. Um, the, we we don't often engage students in in their own discussions about real topics that they're really interested in, and part of that I think is the p power structure um, that you know often in our education system teachers want to be the one in control of the conversation, and so it's really hard to let go of the reins and allow um, and to trust students to engage in you know real conversation around real topics of interest. Um, and so, you know, when you posted that, Brennan, I was really interested in what opportunities you you had to really engage in good discussion. Um, and so I appreciated that. Um, okay, on to question number seven already. I'm being really wordy. Again, um, Facebook, uh, the Facebook Live option is a much better option for me because I have a really hard time t keeping my response to 140 characters. Um, so for those of you just joining, we are discussing Creative Schools by Ken Robinson, although kind of the bigger theme uh, for the discussion is the idea of personalized education versus the current standards movement. Um, and uh, so we're, we're kind of splitting this between Facebook, the Facebook live stream, and then also the, the Twitter stream. So if you're interested, we're using hashtag EFreads over on Twitter, and then also you can comment in the comment sections on Facebook. Um, it, my good friend Eric says, I think the students need to take the wheel and create products uh, to create the change so the stakeholders can see through the eyes of the students and then join the fight as the advocates and pull in their connections. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, th that I think too provides an opportunity for students, for children, kids, um, and, and their families to discuss something that's really important. Um, so it gives them a voice at home, but then it also gives them a, a larger voice in the community and then, it br and then brings it back to creative decision making. Um, one thing that I've noticed, you know, in, in my school district right now, um, we're, we're struggling with um, settling our, our contract, our teaching contract. And I won't get into all the details on that, but, but something really positive that I think is really positive that has come out of this negative situation is the way that our community is really banding together to support teachers. Um, and through social media, our community has a voice. Um, and, and they're seeing things through the eyes of teachers in a way that they haven't been able to see it before because for many people in the community, and, and many families too, their only experience with school is their own experience as students, but then also the limited amount of time that they're invited to come to school. And typically when they're invited to come to school, they're invited to attend an open house where they're being talked at by the teachers or by the administration, or where they're, they're not a part of any sort of um, creation or, or discussion. It's just kind of a sit and get, and then you go home. Um, and so, you know, coming together in a way that engages parents, so as Eric suggested, you know, having kids lead the charge, having them talk about it so that parents can see it through the eyes of the people who are immersed in it right now. Um, and then, and my thought would be the same, that we need to have fluid conversations. We need to invite everyone to the table um, because as Daniel suggested, it takes a village. So we need the village to come on in and we need to, to honor their voices. We need to trust the voices. Um, and not just sit back and listen to the people who the current system worked for, because those are the ones right now that have the loudest voices that are making all of the choices. Um, on Facebook, Brennan says, 
Uh, oh, she's responding to my, my question about when they were able, she was able to have discussions in school. She says, it was mostly only when I was taking college classes that we were able to engage in healthy discussions about um, whatever the topic of the class was. I will say it would have been more fun and engaging had those discussions been in the art classes I was taking <laughs> rather than in politics. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's Stephanie, uh, Christensen, Stephanie Thompson, if you're still on here, um, and I can't see whether you are or not, but if you're still on here, you know, as an art teacher, what do discussions in an art class look like? How do you engage kids in, you know, talking about things they're passionate about, think their creativity um, in, in an art setting, as opposed to where a lot of, you know, discussion and debate takes place in a history or politics or social studies class? Um, so again, we're on question seven over on Twitter, and the question is, um, oh, we're already on question seven. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson advocates for engaging students' curiosity. How do we do this? Um, and so some responses on Twitter are, uh, this is the point of, this is John's post, this is the point of uh, number three of Manifesto 15. If you haven't read Manifesto 15, it's a... Uh, um, a document that has 12 principles for how we can evolve learning um, and you can read it at manifesto15.org um, so John's point is get out of their way building freedom and responsibility so that's in response to how do we engage students curiosity um, expose students to resources experiences mentors peers and allow exploration of concepts and ideas that they discover and as as teachers facilitate don't teach um, oh, I'm not keeping up very well. Uh, curiosity requires a safe space. We need to establish relationships first um, before anything else. You know, I think that's really important, that idea of establishing relationships. Um, because, you know, I can think of teachers when I was in school that, you know, the topic may not have been something I was interested in um, or that I really fully wanted to engage in, but because I had a really good relationship with the teacher, I, I was more willing to kind of follow where they were going um, than I would have been if, you know, when, in thinking about the teachers that I didn't care for. Um, and so, you know, being more willing to engage in something that maybe wasn't fully a part of my interest, um, I could, you know, find, find ways for... Um, find areas of interest within that because I was willing to engage because I had that positive, safe, healthy relationship, mutual respect with, with those teachers. So I think um, that that's a, that's a really good point. Um, let's see. Looking on Facebook, there aren't any other comments. So we're on already to question eight. Um, Ken Robinson says a learner and an educator together are critical for a great learning experience. Is this true? Um, so my when I when I first uh, read that part of the book, and again for those of you just joining us, we're talking about Ken Robinson's Creative Schools. When I first read that part of the book where he talked about needing a learner and a, and an educator together, it was in the context of. Um, a, a drama. He was t he was sharing an, uh, a, a vignette about um, a teacher that he knew that that taught drama, and it was basically that person suggested all you really need um, is an actor and an audience, and then he was likening that to you know f good teaching um, and learning experiences. All you really need is a is a as a teacher and a learner, and I was. I didn't. I don't care for that idea. I, I think that you absolutely a person can absolutely learn all by themselves and on their own. Um, and that was that was what I said. I, I think I slammed the book down and went to find John to say, oh, I don't agree, um, and then ex expressed my opinion um, in lots of words and probably loudly. Um, but the more that I got to think about it, um, you know, if we're so I, I my frame of reference for responding to that question in that moment was thinking about a teacher in a current role where it's top down, where it's direct instruction. Um, and if I think about it in the way that makes more sense for teaching and learning is one student, one teacher, that's all you need to facilitate high quality learning because the teacher and the student are fluidly moving between both roles within any good or great that was a question great learning experience between a teacher and a learner 
both of them are taking on the role of teacher and learner throughout. Um, it's, it's simultaneous. And I think that better learning takes place in that way, where you're working with, where you're facilitating learning, where you're explaining what you're learning, where you're talking with some other person who's in it with you collaboratively, produces better learning than if you are individually working on your own. Um, so initially, I did not agree with um, what Ken Robinson said about you need a learner and an educator together to create a great learning experience. But now when I think about what the roles of an educator and a learner ought to be in a great learning experience, I changed my mind and said, yes, I think that you do, um, as long as those roles are fluid. Um, my good friend Wendy Marchek says, uh, you can't measure relationships, so it isn't valued in the current education system. Absolutely. Um, so we talked a little bit before about, you know, are we in the system where we value what we measure, which that's where we are now, um, and where we want to be is measuring what we value, right? If we value good relationships, then I don't know that that necessarily requires, requires any other measurement than sort of a self-assessment on am I developing and maintaining positive, respectful relationships with all of my students, with my peers, with my colleagues. Um, but you know, we, right now we're in a system where what we're measuring is literacy and math, and that's pretty much it. And so things that are important like building relationships, like critical thinking skills, like problem solving skills, like problem identifying skills, like creat creative thinking, how can you measure that? Um, and so we don't. And I think that there are ways if we were to come together as a village, as you know, a community of people really looking at how we can evolve learning, we could come up with ways that would be meaningful, that we could somehow quantify um, some of those skills and strategies. Um, I, I think that's sort of the direction where we need to go. But at this point, what we're valuing is the measurement of literacy and math um, and not so much those other kind of soft skills that are much more vital, I think, to um, what we need in, in an education system and, and what students need as they head out of the education system. Um, Eric says, you have to have a sounding board sometimes, absolutely, but you can't get anywhere without those relationships. Talk about a catch-22. Right, That absolutely. Um, you know, building relationships is is key, and it's and it's building positive relationships. You know, all over. Um, I had someone the other day suggest to me that I should, you know, get my admin license and maybe become a principal. Or may, and I no way because even though I think that probably to really get a ball rolling in in a situation where we're making more change. Um, that might be where I would need to go. I can't imagine being pigeonholed into the um, the system like that in in a in a way where I'm trying to fall in line with what's current within the system and then also making change. Um, because I think too many times we've seen great leaders pushed out of the education system because that's exactly what they're trying to do. Um, I would much rather focus my energies on building that team. Of, of people, the community team, parents, teachers, especially students, um, administrators, and you know, community members, and, and anyone who's, who's willing to come together because you know, we know that we need to make some changes, especially because our world is, is changing and we're, we're able to be much more global and much more connected. And as a result, we need to make, we need to make changes. We can't be educating using you know, 200 year old ideas about what education is for. Um, Stephanie uh, talks about the Torrance test um, and that measures creativity uh, and yeah, I'd forgotten about that so yeah we do have um, a way to measure creativity um, and the Torrance test is great it's a Minnesota product says John um, and Brennan Fleischman says I also think it's important to stress that good relationships with the tough kids <laughs> is just as important as the relationships with the students who are already engaged in learning if not more important um, yeah, I absolutely agree. There was a there's a video that's kind of gone viral on on Facebook and uh, social media, and I and I posted it um, to our educators, our Bloomington Federation of Teachers website the other day, and it's about um, it, it just shows the reactions of students when teachers teachers took a video camera and um, pulled individual students and basically just said, you know, you're important to me, 
you um, you make m my day. I come to work, I come to school um, because uh, you know my, my experience at school is positive because of you and it, and it was basically just videotaping the reactions of those kids um, and you know just the idea of how important it is to know that you're valued by someone you know you, you go to a place every day and you do what you're told and you, you know you, you, you follow the rules you follow the directions you play school really well um, and how often are you really told how much your relationship within that structure is valued by um, the, the, the people that you're working with, the people that are that are evaluating you and your progress. Um, and I think it's key, like Brennan said, you know, is it, to, to develop the relationships with, with all the kids, including and especially maybe the tough kids, because the tough kids may be the tough kids because they're balking at the idea of playing school. Um, sometimes, you know, as teachers, what we want are the compliant kids. Uh, and the compliant kids are the ones that sit there and do what they're told and they furiously take notes when you're talking and they engage in conversation because they're supposed to and they do their homework and they turn their homework in on time and yay, those are the great students because they're playing school really well. And the tough kids, they don't want to do that. The tough kids have other things they want to talk about, other things they want to think about. So the kids that aren't compliant, they're, they're kind of doing their own thing. And rather than stifling th that, um, providing creative outlets for them to be able to do the things that they need to do and and valuing uh, that they don't feel they need to play school to get what they need to out of the time that they spend with you in your class. Eric says the tough kids are the best ones to have if you can get them you're golden half the time they aren't as tough as they appear. Right, absolutely because I just I wrote a blog post about this a few months ago about the idea of um, you know, being being captive versus being captivated, right? And so, you know, we make kids come to school from eight to three every day, and and they're held captive there. Um, they they don't have a choice about being there. They have to be there, and they don't really have a choice about what they're supposed to do while they're there. And you know, as a result, we have kids that play school really well, and and they're maybe learning some things. We have kids that sit and, and daydream or think their own things and they're being quiet so they're not tough kids because they're, you know, at least they're sitting there and they're not being disruptive. And then we have the kids that are being disruptive and, you know, they're talking to their friends, they're getting up to sharpen their pencil, they're going to the bathroom every five minutes, they're, you know, poking their next door neighbor, they're taking notes, they're staring out the window. You know, those things that we, you know, we need to manage those behaviors, right? What's your behavior management plan? Um, when, you know, really what we need to do is is create captivating experiences as opposed to holding them captive in a classroom and then punishing the kids who are are expressing that they don't want to be held captive. <laughs> um, Brennan says some of the smartest kids I went to school with were tough kids. I'm certain it's because they didn't uh oh because they didn't want to play school and because they were probably bored. Yep, absolutely. Although I think Richard Cash is on here and he would have, chime in Richard, he has um, some things to say about being bored in school. We just had a conversation with him the other night about boredom. Um, so Richard, if you're on here, chime in. Um, Stephanie says, you don't need to, sh oh, never mind. Um, so Stephanie's got a comment on Facebook that if you are interested, you could go there, but I won't share it. Um, basically about looking at how you use the Torrance test to measure growth um, and, and how that looks um, for kids in, in, a, in a program in our school system. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. I know I'm way behind on questions. Uh, question nine. Um, Ken Robinson advocates for deeper parent integration in schools. What are your best ideas to make that happen? Um, some of the, oh, Stephanie says I can share it, so I'll share that in just a minute. Um, it's advocates for deeper parent integration in schools. What are your best ideas to make it happen? Um, John says, I think we need to involve parents in the conversation about setting a vision for the future of education, and why haven't we? Daniel says, Building, uh, build web library showing best parent involvement going on now in poverty schools, in rural schools, not just affluent schools. Oh, that's such a good point. Um, we held informal creativity talks and began by discussing traits of the creative mind um, with a small group of thoughtful citizens. Um, for, you know, for me, the, the, I think that, you know, like I said before, we invite parents in and talk at them. 
instead of inviting parents in and engaging in conversation with them. And I think that's the key. You know, if we really want to involve parents in what we're doing at schools, we have to honor and value their voice and their thoughts and their ideas. And we just haven't done a very good job of that lately. Um, and like, uh, like, like Daniel says, um, you know, looking at how we can involve parents in all kinds of schools, not just the affluent schools, because, you know, in my experience, um, parents in the more affluent schools are much more likely to be involved in what's going on at school, sometimes overly involved and, and, and not in uh, a collaborative way um, and sometimes not in a positive way. Um, and often the, the parents in the schools that are of, uh, you know, higher poverty areas um, aren't as involved. And that sometimes is a cultural thing. That sometimes is a working the third shift and not having childcare, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. But how can we get everyone involved? Because we want to hear from and value and honor and trust all parent voices. And so again, for my thinking is we, we invite them in to be a valued part of the conversation instead of invite them in to, to be talked at. Um, through an open house sort of forum or something like that. Um, so uh, going back to, we were talking about, you know, measuring creativity and what that looks like. And Stephanie shared that um, the first students who initially took the Torrance test to get into Nobel, which is a um, honors arts program in, um, in our school district, uh, they took the second version of the Torrance test at the end of eighth grade. After three years of Nobel, of the, of the Honors Arts Program, all students showed significant growth, more than 30 points, um, or 50% to 11th and beyond. Um, so, you know, that, that speaks a lot to how the Nobel Program at, um, at, at this school in our district is really valuing um, creativity and, and, then, and then figuring out a way to, to, to measure that. Um, and I can I speak as a parent about that too, because my son is in the program. This, he, he'll be going into his second year in the program as a seventh grader. Um, and he comes home, he came home last year as a sixth grader, um, so much more aware and talkative and excited about the things that he was learning in all classes, not just the Nobel classes, but in all classes, where he was using, he was being honored for his creative thinking um, and, and then using that, transferring those skills to other areas of the curriculum. His grades, they're okay. Uh, standardized test scores, honestly, I haven't looked. I think I got the letter and I haven't paid attention because I don't care about that. Um, but in the past, they've been fine, um, you know, mediocre, not high. Um, but the things that matter to me are that he's connecting with things that he's interested in and that he's being valued for his creative thinking. And so I can attest as a parent that the Honors Arts Program Nobel um, in our school district has done wonders for him as a student and then for the kinds of conversations that we at home are able to engage in with him. Um, Daniel says engaging parents and businesses is difficult um, and that he doesn't have the answers and neither do we. Um, but he's been seeking out websites since 1998 of people who are already trying to do this. I mean, he adds them to a web library so that he and others can learn from what's already been tried. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then he suggests others should be building web libraries for the same purposes. And then he posted a link on the Education Futures chat comment um, to his library and, and says we can go and, and take a look at that and look at the four sections of what he's, he's built in his library. That's awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, so now we're looking at, we're on to question number 10. Uh, question 10 is, Ken Robinson says, we need a revolution and an action plan. How can we best come together to create a plan of action? Um, and so we've got some comments on Twitter. We need to set pathways for education policy, building from the ground up and student out, not the other way around. Um, to talk about a strategy of electing representatives who will support these pathways, including um, and including that step in the planning process. Um, the idea to invite all stakeholders for a fluent conver or fluid conversation with the common theme of building positive education futures, and then trusting and respecting all voices. Um, and again, you know, I think that. I, I, I mentioned this before, but, and again, we're, I'm looking at question number 10, which is um, needing a revolution and an action plan. Um, how can we best come together to create a plan of action? And I think that what we've been doing is coming up with an action plan before we actually have developed the goal. 
So we're coming up with steps to get somewhere and we don't know where we're going. And so my thought is we have to come together with the community, with the village, with all of the stakeholders and develop the goal. What are we educating for? What's the purpose? What does learning mean? What does teaching look like? What, why are we doing this? Um, and then start looking at what the action steps might be. Because I can't imagine what the action steps might be, the plan might be, until we, until we know where we're going. Um, because then how do you know if you've gotten there? And, and, and if we're just putting in action steps, and then we're right now in, in this era of you know, accountability, then we're measuring the results of these action steps, and we have no idea if we're leading kids toward what the ultimate goal is, because we don't have one. Um, so for me, I think, you know, yeah, I agree, Ken Robinson, um, we need a revolution, but we need to start with the, the, the why, um, what, what are we educating for? And once we know that, once we've come together and come up with an idea about that, then we can start looking at what the steps are for the action plan. Um, Shiny Christie says, I second that, uh, uh, I second that Daniel, um, talking about building the library of, um, of resources for engaging parents and businesses. Um, so she seconds that because uh, they are also the byproduct of a system that confirmed to economic returns on education investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure we can collectively come up with an alternative approach to parental intervention. Yep, so again, coming together, looking at what we can do collectively um, to engage all stakeholders. Um, looking back at Twitter, um, it looks like there were just those 10 questions. Um, and so just in closing, I would like to thank everyone that participated in our very first, um, virtual book club. It was super fun. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed being able to talk the whole time. I don't often get a chance to teach anymore. Not that I was a, a talker like this the whole time I taught. Um, cause again, like I said, in response to the question about what, what is the purpose of teaching? It's facilitating learning, not talking the whole time. Um, but I really did enjoy it. And, um, so thank you for your participation cause it, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Um, and then just, you know, in, in looking into the future next month, finish lessons 2.0 is the book that we will, uh, be discussing. And, um, that will be on October 1st, the first Saturday in October. Um, following that, we have my good friend Richard Cash's book, Self-Regulation in the Classroom, um, and that will be on November 5th. Uh, the book club for that will be on November 5th. And actually, John and I just uh, met with Richard Cash and, and interviewed him for an upcoming podcast, uh, and w this is going to be a phenomenal book club discussion, so I highly, highly recommend that you join us on November 5th for this one. Um, and then on December 3rd, we're looking at Peter Gray's Free to Learn, um, so a different approach to what, uh, what education looks like. Um, and then after that, we've got some suggestions for books that we're looking at. Um, Weapons of Math Destru Destruction, right? Math Destruction? Yeah. Um, recommended to us by Wendy Marchek. And um, we've got some other, other books that, we have, um, that we're looking into as, as recommendations as well. Um, the last couple things I'd like to say is uh, join us. We do a weekly Twitter chat on Thursdays at, um, I think we're just, we're only going to do 7 p.m. now on Thursdays, Central Standard Time, um, which just kind of talks about different topics and themes that are current in the field of education. Um, so join us there. Twitter, we use hashtag uh, edfutures, edfutures, hashtag edfutures for that one. Um, and then also we have launched a bi-weekly podcast, so you can head over to um, iTunes or look on or look at educationfutures.com slash, what is it, John? Reads. S slash reads for the podcast? Oh, the no. podcast? Oh, slash. Educationfutures.com. And, it's and right you'll find page. information right there on the, the podcast page. there. Yep. So you can uh, log in there, and it's basically John and me drinking some wine and talking about uh, topics in education. Um, and then we also have special guests like, like our friend Richard Cash. Um, we just interviewed Garrett, uh, Garrett Zimmer, Zimmer yeah. who is the Minecraft um, in Education guy. Uh, and that will be in the, in the next podcast that comes out this Saturday. Um, we'll and we'll have, yeah, we'll have more authors. I think it's just going to be sort of a fun thing. And, and again, just like this book club, we can't make that go without contributions from you. It's not just about John and me sitting together and talking. We really want to have it be an engaging conversation with everyone. So email us thoughts, email us questions, email us arguments, um, and we will read those on our podcast and engage in conversation that way. 
Um, and so I think my last piece in closing is to read um, the comments that Wendy Marchek just posted on Facebook. She says, the plan is imposed upon teachers and then students. Absolutely. And in closing, she says, I can handle starting the revolution if you can take it from there. Yay, we can do it. Um, yeah, we can do it. Let's do it. Let's revolutionize um, what we're doing in, in education for, um, for the sake of all our kids. Again, thank you so much, and we will see you for um, Finished Lessons 2.0 in one month, October 1st.